today I have been asked to speak on uh, Rabindranath Tagore as a, as an academic as a as an educator of people's education, and I would like to uh, speak on him. In fact, Rabindranath Tagore was a genius in the true sense of the term. Not only was he the greatest poet and literature of India, he contemplated deeply on the state of education of our country, including that of the broad masses. He also translated his thoughts into action. He was a seer. He had the foresight to predict the ill effects of the consumer society way back in 1920s. His ideas about all-round education of the child and adolescents are extremely relevant in the present context. His thoughts are so multifaceted and multidimensional that it is very difficult to present them in the short duration of a few hours. However, we shall provide a sketch only that listeners are advised to go through his works, which are available, I think, in all the libraries of the world. And if you do not get it in a right away, please write to me and I will write, try to give you the, uh, you know, the source, uh, reference sources. So I would like to ask uh, Johan to kindly show the first slide. You know, I, I would like to present my lecture in slides. So Johan, could you please show the slide? The first slide, please. Yeah, Rabindranath Tagore was born in 1861 in an illustrious family of Bengal. Bengal was part of India in Eastern part and later on it became divided into West Bengal and Bangladesh. He was born in West Bengal, of course, in Calcutta. The born in British colonial India, Tagore was brought up in a family that valued immensely Indian tradition and culture. His family was extremely you know, uh, enlightened and uh, they were uh, they, are, they were some, some of the you know first families of you know colonial Bengal, you might say. And they were very much, I can see the slide. Uh, they were very much go is a phenomena, wrote the poet Buddha de Bosch. He was our Chaucer and Shakespeare, he was Chaucer and Shakespeare and our Dryden. And he compresses in one man's lifetime, the development of several centuries. So, you know, he was really, you know, I do not know how to, uh, but, you know, this interpretation, this, you know, explanation of Tagore is quite correct. So, he was an Indian born in the colonial period of India. The next slide, please. Uh, Tagore was a pioneer in education, a rebel against formal education in his youth. In fact, he could not complete even his schooling, you know. He studied up to class eight or something and then left. But of course he studied at home. A rebel against formal education in his youth, he tried to revive the ancient Indian concept of the place of learning as Tapovana. Tapovana means forest, you know, where you know the saints used to have their school. And he wanted to do this at his school called Shantiniketan, which if it is uh, you know, interpreted as the abode of peace, he established it in 1901. To this school, he added a university called Vishya Bharati. Vishya Bharati means where the whole knowledge of the world, uh, Vishwa and Bharati is the knowledge uh, comes together in one place. That he did in 1921. And also, he added a wing called Sri Niketan. In fact, an Englishman called Leonard Elmers supported him for you know, establishing this. And this is for art, craft. And 
which was the backbone of the Indian village economy and culture. And I have, no, no, please, the previous slide, please. And you will find that here, there are, you know, the students, they're learning in the, under the tree. If you go to Shantiniketan, you will find that still now, you know, this tradition is going on because he felt that the four walls of his school building, you know, that in fact is claustrophobic. So in the open air, and then this is the first building of Vishavarati, and then it extended. And this one, of course, the same thing, you know, people are discussing under the tree. He was thoroughly opposed to education through a foreign language. It's just a grown thing. In his school, mother tongue was the medium of education. He was opposed to learning by rote. You know, in this case, he's very, very much akin to cold. Eastern cold. In his school at Shantiniketan, the children attended classes in the open, in the midst of nature. Children were taught to appreciate nature in all its splendor. You know, you find a glimpse of another, you know, the classroom. And this is a regular uh, feature. If you visit Shantiniketan in West Bengal, he will find these things. And, and this he had, you know, tried to revive that Tapuvana, the forest dwelling tradition in the midst of the village, you know, in his school at Shantiniketan. Next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Tego said, and you find this very interesting. We still need the forest and the residence of the Guru for learning. This is just as Grunvi could have said. The forest is our lovely abode and the Guru is our passionate teacher. If we have to establish an ideal school, this should be away from the city in the silence of the open sky and the wide horizon and among the trees. If possible, there should be an adjacent piece of land for cultivation of crops, necessary foodstuff would be produced there. The students would help in farming. In favorable weather, classes would take place under the shadow of trees. The evening would be spent in knowing the stars, in singing, in discussing history and myth. So much common with, you know, what Grunvig had thought 100 years ago. So I have uh, studied Grunvig and Tagore uh, as much as I could. And I found that these two great educators have very many things in common. And from this quotation, you can find it. Okay. Tego was one of the great, you know, uh, pioneers of even adult education in India. In fact, you know, he was he was from a landlord family. They had estates, landlord estates in East Bengal, which is now in Bangladesh, in Silaidaha and Patisha. There, he had started adult schools, you know, night schools for the uh, nearly, for the illiterate people. And also when he started Shantiniketan, there also the same, you will find, you know, the picture is there. In the adult education also, he started in Shantiniketan. In the same way, he was a great uh, lover of uh, cooperative movement. In fact, he had written quite a lot on Danish cooperative movement. And here on the right hand side, you find the office of the cooperative society at Shantiniketan. And if you go to Shantiniketan today, you will also find that the cooperative society is functioning, which was founded in 1905, uh, 6, around that time. Still now, that kind of society, or maybe in a different, uh, um, different societies are now functioning in Shantiniketan. So, uh, you know, uh, that is a very good connection with Denmark, a very good connection with uh, the folk high school tradition that Tagore. In fact, we can even say that Shantiniketan wa was one of the foremost folk high schools of uh, India. And of course, he did not, just like Grunvi wanted the Nordic uh, you know, University of Gothenburg. In the same way, 
in the same place tagore had you know developed his own university called vishwavarathi you know which is now one of the central universities of india and quite you know uh, life so that way and there is also as i told you he had developed sri niketan for art and craft so these three wings together make a complete you know example of tagore's thinking about education which he had written very much during his lifetime and then he had established these places to in fact concretize his thoughts into action thank you very much this is the first part thank you ashok and this is really interesting i was just at a conference in sweden where some of the those participants that had not heard so much about about tagore so i think this is a a really interesting perspective for many of us um oh thank you the, thank you the first part of the presentation was meant mostly as an, as an introduction to tagore we are opening up for questions now are is there anybody who wants to has as a question to the first part about uh, tagore's uh, historical the historical tagore and, and his um, impact on the indian society I, I I I was wondering about how how do you see the impact of Tagore still today? Ashok? In how India, you, yeah, in India today. What, yeah, what, yeah. What, what, Tagore, in fact, after his death uh, in 1941, his stature in India has grown and grown. Now, just like Grunvi, his poetry is uh, you know recited on all occasions. He has written. More than two thousand songs, and these songs, in any occasion, you know, from birth till death, you know, people will sing together as a chorus and individually. There are so many Tagore Song Academy uh, here in <laughs> Calcutta, in India. You know, we do not, uh, and also I think in Bangladesh, we do not start any work without Tagore song. And then Tagore's, you know, these his whole educational thoughts, you know, that is also being, you know, people go to Shantiniketan uh, to see these children, you know, sitting on the tree, uh, you know, taking classes and uh, all the cooperatives. They go there. So it's uh, Tagore has become a phenomenon, just like Gandhi, you know, in every walk of life of us in india and particularly of the bengalis who speak bengali language he is there so <laughs> he's in fact what he was in his lifetime he became a phenomenon in his lifetime but after that he has become something you know extraordinary in our uh, everyday uh, living so that much i can tell you and i would invite all of you you know if we have the opportunity to organize a seminar in Calcutta, then I would make uh, an arrangement for you to visit Shantiniketan and see for yourself what he had really done uh, almost 100 years back. Um, you'd be astounded. Actually, when I've studied Tego, Freire, and Grunfri, I found that you know uh, there is very much uh, connection uh, in their thoughts and it is very possible because you know great men think alike tagore i have found the tagore and freire they walked in, tagore walked in the colonial uh, society and freire walked in the post colonial society of the so called third world I, I do not like this word third world but you know brazil and india you know somehow we have been bracketed together as a third world and this third world, because of colonialism, has been fragmented by narrow domestic walls of racism and casteism, of course, which, is, which was our, <laughs> and class antagonism. Both of them contemplated on the plight of the mute millions of their people and sought ways and means by which their economic, political, and social conditions can be improved. 
Tagore had developed cooperatives. Tagore had started Sriniketan, where the crafts, art and crafts of the you know, artisans were practiced, sold in the market, you know, to give them a boost. He also used to you know, organize country fairs where their products would come and people would people from the cities and you know uh, people who had money in the rural areas could come and buy those products so both of them were very much uh, inclined uh, to uh, help the poor people in various ways and of course uh, both were adult educators and i think that Freire was almost an Einstein uh, who had developed this 30 hours to literacy technique, which was not there. So it was a great innovation by which he had supported his uh, you know, people over there. So I think, you know, this is first comparison. The next. Yeah. And if we come to Grunvik's uh, attitude also, very similar. His concept of enlightenment is closely related to the awakening of the people. People means, you know, the peasants through the literature, history, and culture of a nation, you know, which to which they were not, you know, automatically uh, exposed, but through his folk high schools, he thought they would be exposed. Myths, folklore, legends, and the anecdotes of history root them to their tradition. All these awaken the people and make them conscious participants in the democratic institutions. Because Grunvig, he understood that Denmark was going to be a democratic nation. And in democratic nation, if the people are not enlightened, whom they will vote, who will rule them? So he was very conscious about democracy, real democracy in his own country. In the same way, Freire, you all know, was a victim of you know, dictatorship when he wanted to give this literacy to the people because you know the people when they vote when they're literate only then they can vote and you know when a person becomes literate can know the alphabets you know he or she liberates himself or herself can know what is happening in the world read the newspaper everything you know so that way you know, his practice of freedom was through education. So both these thinkers had the same, they want this freedom, Grunvig wanted for his people and Freire also wanted for his people. Okay, and also the freedom to choose. This is a Sartian, a man can be a decoyed or, a, or an enlightened person. You know, there is a choice, an active choice and Freire, I gave this active choice to the people. So next slide. I would like to go to the yeah, third. Tagore's concept of education called for an all-round development of the personality. Culture played an important role in this process. Fine arts and crafts, dance and music, literature and science, all these things you will find at Vishwarat. If you go there, there is a science faculty, there is a fine arts faculty, there is, you know where music, dance, arts, all these are taught and also literature. Uh, so, you know, all these he prescribed for the proper growth of the faculties of the child. Freire started his literacy process from the premise of culture. As you know, he started with theater. And then from that, you know, he went into the realm of literacy and that also broadened in the realm of freedom. So both of them, both Tagore and Freire had, you know, uh, this, they were very much concerned with the personalities of the people, you know, whom they were enlightening. So, uh, and I've given, this is a dance, you know, Tagore dance, a picture I've given. Uh, it's a combination of Indian dance tradition, Java dance tradition, you know, many other countries of the world. And beautiful, if you look at it in a stage, you will be mesmerized. And on the right-hand side, there is this picture of Freudian, you know, cultural circle. Okay, thank you. Next slide. 
Grunwick's concept of folkelier related to fruition of people's intrinsic national culture. It is closely connected to language, tradition, and heritage of a particular nation. Culture, according to Freire, is what is practiced by the people as a transformed nature. In a unique way, he obliterates the differentiation between the artisan and the artist, showing that both of them transfer nature in their unique ways. He even equates the professor with the sweeper, because in his opinion, both are cultural workers. Culture is a human construct, and I have given two pictures down below. One is by Picasso. This is an abstract art by great Picasso. And this one is a sculptor, you know, who, uh, who works with clay. We have a small place near Calcutta called Krishna Nagar. There the clay modeling is very much in vogue, you know. They're appreciated all over India and abroad. And he is uh, making a, a sculpture of Tagore. Both are, both Picasso and this unknown gentleman, both are great, you know, artists. Um, because he's, uh, this artisan is also concerned about his work of art. So, and this was what, in fact, Freire had suggested that both are, you know, they engender culture in their own ways. Next slide, please. Well, I think there is no more slide. So this is what I wanted to say about, uh, this has only been, uh, okay. Uh, a question has come, how did I come to this study? I was in the uh, field in the adult and continuing education department at Jadhav University in Calcutta. And there, you know, I uh, got uh, interested in Dunvigian tradition. And Freire was, you know, we were practicing in the field. Freire's work uh, was being, you know, we, we were practicing in the field. Uh, there were great uh, educators who teach the adult uh, neoliterates what Freire's thinking was, you know, including his literacy method. So uh, that is, uh, this is the way I got into this field of education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashok. I think we'll give you an applause from um, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for, for, uh, for giving us a, a, a real insight from inside of the of the work of, of Tagore. And I really feel like you have taken us on a tour and, and um, we learned so much. Uh, now now we, we want to try to connect between today's presentation of Tagore and Sergio Haddad and Janaina who talked last seminar about Freire and Freire and Grundtvig and their, and their studies on Freire and Grundtvig. So, so Sergio, could we hear a little bit what, what points, I, 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 I hear several, uh, of uh, of your, I see some of the slides that you showed last time and the thoughts that were central in your presentation, that are like the enlightenment uh, uh, concept. Which which concepts would you say are the most important that connect these three thinkers? Sergio. And thank you, Johan. And thank you, Ashok. Very interesting. And I will speak in Portuguese. Quero cumprimentar aqui. I would like to greet some friends who are here this morning, people joining us in this work, Timothy, Elena, various people who are friends. I admire greatly the work of Asok and many of the things that he wrote. I was able to use, apply in my comparative work between Freire and Grundtvig thanks to that first inspiration that he brought to us. I would say 
that uh, many things that Asoki has already mentioned, uh, but I would like to raise some new comparative issues between the three, our three thinkers within the field of popular education. And back then, the first aspect that I wanted to raise is that differently from Grundvig and Tagore, Paulo Freire was not a rebel. He wasn't, in his youth, a rebel against formal education, formal schooling. On the contrary, he went to school, former school. He was a person that followed his uh, schooling, his schooling career all the way through, and he graduated in law. However, despite not having been a rebel in that sense, uh, as, as similarly to Grunwig and Tagore, he was very critical of uh, formal education later on in his life, particularly during the period in which he wrote pedagogy, in which he compares what would be a bank education with a liberating education, showing how much formal education can actually become a bank related. And for that, he starts to develop or translate a pedagogical approach that is specific to that issue of how to conform an, a liberating education. In that sense, liberating, and here is the second element that I wanted to mention that I think Tagore brought very well, uh, there is some uh, sound filtering through. The second aspect has to do with the relationship between education and politics, education and democracy. I think all three educators built their pedagogical thought process trying to join pedagogy, education, politics, politics, uh, not party politics, the idea of uh, gaining insight, becoming conscious uh, in the sense of enlightenment or awareness, stepping from their reality to build individual and collective histories in such a way that uh, they can go to the problems and try to translate those issues, those problems that these people experience into actions, into actions that transform reality to a democratic society. For that, our horizontality, valuing of the word, of each one, which person, all of these elements that lead us to a popular education, to an education for the people that uh, is for those classes that are least favored. The third element, Tagori and Grundvik defended is that Tagori and Grundvik defended this education in the mother tongue. And Freire also clearly did this when he went to work in, in African countries, being liberated from the Portuguese uh, colonial system where he defended that the entire educational process and liter literacy process was carried out in the people's mother tongue to bring precisely the local culture that had been erased by the Portuguese colony. In that sense, 
he was very, he emphasized greatly and was even against the revolutionary leaders. He defended the importance of the Portuguese language as a, as a vehicle of dialogue with other regimes and other countries. A few more elements that I think are important. Translating the idea of mother tongue, when Freire goes back and becomes a minister for education, he was very clear in stating that a popular language, the language of the people, of popular groups, people's groups in formal schools, in public schools, should be respected and could not be corrected as if they were incorrect, as if they were wrong. That they needed to be valued and to show that there was also another language, a formal language that the school attempts to translate, but that is different. Uh, these are different ways of speaking Portuguese and that one is no better than the other and both should be respected in the process of learning. A third or fourth, I lost count. All three were pioneers in thinking adult education as owned education that wasn't a reproduction of child education, that was of his own, that had its own nature towards uh, young and you know, youth and adults. And I think this was uh, highlighted in all three pedagogues, all three educators as uh, something quite uh, featured in their work. The last element of the many that we could uh, raise here is the relationship between educator, education, excuse me, and culture, between education and culture, thinking about tradition, language, myths, music, arts, in heritage of a nation, but in particular of the popular sectors. There would, be no, there would be no idea of more or less knowledge. Everyone would have knowledge in their views. Everyone would have their own culture. And through the exchange of that knowledge and the dialogue between that knowledge among those uh, various sources of knowledge is horizontally is that democracy is built. And from then, to make it possible to build a society that is more democratic. So I think that it's very important uh, to make this uh, valuing of culture that all three educators brought forward. I am not a specialist in Tagori. I learned greatly with Asaki. I learned, I studied Freire in, in more depth, clearly, uh, but I, studied Grundvik as well, and I was able to perceive in the presentation before me how much they are, they coincide in their, in some proposals that may be translated into a liberating education, freeing education, a popular education, an education that has to do with democracy. That's uh, it for now, thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. And, and uh, we are also, we're always very impressed by your knowledge and your vision of, of the combination of these. Uh, in, in the core committee, this has been one of our, our, our big discussions. How, how can we, what elements are there among these three great uh, champions of, of, of uh, people's education uh, to, um, 
that 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 can be distilled that, that we can find and maybe some of those can give us a vision of what we can do today and how we can reach uh, how we can form adult education um, i'm thinking about you sergey and and the concrete situation in ukraine uh, that that's that's maybe the most uh, the most um, uh, um, acute situation but also i know we have americans here we have uh, I'm, I myself come from Sweden, where, where, where popular education, I just came from a conference where popular education might be, uh, you know, downgraded very much from the government side because of populistic parties. Um, so there is there is a, there is many challenges around the world where we need to learn or could learn from these uh, that, that actually did manage to influence their societies on a large level. So welcome back, and I hope you had a good talk. We, we were just uh, thinking, we were, were asking ourselves how we best would get to know a little bit about what questions. It would be interesting to know from some of you what questions were became most important in Europe. And, and Julie, could you say something about the English One group? What, what questions do you think were the most caught people's attention the most? Uh, yes. Um, so we, we talked a bit, well, we also talked a bit about other things as well, um, where our conversation kind of meandered a bit. Um, but we looked at the impact um, in the different geographical setting um, and talked about, um, you know, the fact that each of these um, uh, of these uh, philosophers and, and activists um, really uh, addressed a need in society, right? There was a need amongst the people um, that they really um, fulfilled and they really spoke to, right? Um, and, and, um, and in the moment, in many ways crisis, um, that they were able to um, provide a path, not give a voice, but provide a path um, for people to find their own voice. Um, and I think that was incredible. And, and, um, and also um, the fact that uh, if we then look at each of these very disparate locations and time periods, uh, if we look at today, and I come, for example, from the United States, uh, from Wisconsin, which is a very divided state, um, and, you know, looking at uh, the, the elections, for example, today in the US, um, that of the 5 million people in my, um, in my state, only 2.4 voted, right? So even though, you know, almost 50% voted this way and almost 50% voted that way, 50, another 50%, another half of the population didn't vote at all. And where are their voices, right? Um, and so I think absolutely um, the folk high school and these you know, critical pedagogics have a have a place in democracy. Have a place in 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 leading people to find their own voice. If they voted, what would they say? Would they lean this way? Would they lean that way? I don't know, but they haven't had you know they haven't shared it. So again, um, they get um, kind of to be a cog in the machine. Um, and so yeah, we kind of went back and forth looking at Ukraine, looking at the United States. Um, also Gambia uh, and, and all over also in, in Greece, um, the importance of, yeah, um, both sides too, not just the students, um, but the teachers, the trainers, that it's on both sides of it. And I'm done. <laughs> yeah, you on, you have to turn on your mic, you're muted. I, I said something about you, Sergey, and about about when you had to, you got to introduce yourself a little bit. Could you say something about these these uh, uh, the, the concepts and the ideas that were talked about here in the in the Ukrainian situation? Oh, it's, um, much asked, I, said, maybe. I said I said in my group uh, the Ukrainian society, especially the pedagogic society. Uh, do the first step uh, on this road. Uh, That's why, um, as for the name of uh, Paulo Freire, I think that maybe 100 people who know who was Paulo Freire, 
uh, and the important role of this uh, scientist uh, in the world of pedagogic. Uh, we haven't any information about this. Um, I'm looking for the partners uh, for big project with Nichopping University in our Ukrainian universities, universities. And I can't find any doctors or teachers who can be interesting in this way. It's absent in our uh, pedagogic par paradigm. That's why all information that we can uh, get to our pedagogic society from the, this topic is very important uh, for our country. That's why uh, all these things is, is, is very... It's hard to speak about this because we haven't experience of critical pedagogic, uh, we haven't experience of uh, dialogue pedagogic, we have very strong tradition of dominate the state and the society, the teacher and the children and the student, and now we crash this, uh, this situation. And uh, I think that we need all these things, all this information in our pedagogic society, all, all that you can give, we will take and put in, in the mindset of, of our teachers and pedagogues. Thank you, Thank you. And, and you're very welcome to send you or, or any of your staff persons are very welcome to apply also for the international further education program. We will, I will put the link in the on Facebook about it in the end too. So yeah, yeah, of course. Um, David, we were we were thinking too. Could you could you have some idea? To tell us something about what happened in your group. Uh, uh, sure, but uh, Michael uh, also will have some commentary, but uh, I put into the, into the chat uh, some of what we had talked about with the lead of Ashok, the education of the elites versus the people's education, and this refers to what, Sergey, you just uh, shared as well, uh, and I see this as a need for uh, putting a new value, uh, you know, where is the value in society now, where are the values? and putting a new need uh, on uh, a new value on democratic education. Uh, I'm not sure that we as pedagogues uh, are going to be able to lead the way. I think it's going to be the youth and minorities. Uh, we have examples of movements uh, which have uh, achieved this uh, conscientization, the, the consciousness raising uh, that's out there. And uh, we, we heard, uh, from, uh, for example, Tracy uh, telling us in England what is happening in England with adult education. And there is this evisceration, there is this uh, uh, take, uh, moving away from uh, democratic education, whether adult education or whatever. Uh, but we need to move towards this uh, uh, appreciating the youth and all. And I would also like to give a call out about the media. Uh, the media is absolutely dis in terms of uh, education and the emphases that are there. So we need to somehow get to the educate to the media uh, as well. I'm sure Michael has some comments and Ashok as well from our group. Yes, no, I think that David did a very good summary of our dialogue. Uh, I maybe just can add that what became quite obvious to me in the discussion that we had was the um, the question that uh, whether there is a link between the rise and the increase of the anti-democratic movements uh, and the, the kind of devaluation of Bildung, which, which means non-formal education, learning for its own sake, social learning. Um, in that sense that uh, uh, we can ask whether there is a kind of transformation going on of education or of our understanding of education where education today is thought um, of many people just as a way to increase, um, to increase uh, uh, um, or to have a self-improvement of, of your skills in order to better fit the needs of the labor market. So you do an education, you get some credits, you fit better to the needs of the labor market. And uh, building in its actual sense kind of vanishes if you understand what I mean. And, and this is, we don't, um, even though uh, so uh, wanted to have some answers, but maybe we didn't arrive at concrete answers and solutions, but maybe more 
uh, maybe we arrived at some at a certain clarification between certain links of issues. Thank you. I'm I'm really curious now. It was easier for me to ask the the English speaking group, but I know that I'm translated, so, <laughs> so I can ask also. Liana, we were we were talking about somebody who could say something from the from the Portuguese, the Spanish group. I know uh, kind of went into the English and Portuguese group, but. Liana, could you tell us something? Yeah, Sergio, do you have a, your hand is raised too? Sim, posso falar. Posso falar, sim, sobre o nosso grupo. Yes, I can speak uh, on behalf of our, of our group. I would like to say that I totally agree with what David was talking about, about the media, and about the democracy linked to media in general, Facebook, internet, and fake news, how it has been, it has been very important as a way of uh, political action. And afterwards, Following on the line of what um, Janaina was talking about, one of the things that we discussed here, I guess the, the Brazilians that were in the group, we were talking about mainly how it is possible in a country like Brazil to have almost 50% of the population voting against democracy. This is a great challenge for us and for the next few years, because if we want to preserve democracy in our country, much base, much work on the basis of popular actions are necessary. And our intellectuals we are studying here have a lot to contribute this way. And another question, another point that we discussed was how Tagori brings us the possibility of a contemporary reflection that is very important on the environmental point which is certainly nowadays one of our biggest concerns. How can the education of the of adults be connected and involved in the climate crisis and all of the consequences that we are living? One third point, so I'm going to translate a little bit of what Timothy said in our group, which is to get to know, to ask Asoki about Tagori, if he is indeed a national figure, a national um, persona in a country like India with the different languages, if he is really a person that has a national impact on the thinking, on people's thinking. And this is a question, actually. And also, if Timothy allows me to translate his question, is he more of a romantic? Or if he indeed operates, if he is someone that operates concretely, in influencing practices, the educational practices. Yeah, I guess these were the elements, but anyone who would like to make some comment, please, you can say. Should I try I to answer? Yes, I what, think that was uh, a question to you, yes. Yeah. 
I think it's a very appropriate question. Tagore was a great environmentalist. When the, you know, the concept was unknown or very relatively known at that point of time, he had, you know, almost kind of a festival in which he used to plant trees, you know, because in Shantiniketan, he began, you know, those festivals or festivities in which the children, the students, the teachers used to plant trees. He was, in fact, degradation of uh, environment, how it can impact, he has written very much on it. And I think uh, you will have to go through his work on environment. It's absolutely a lot that he has written. And he made, made many, you know, he in fact wrote many songs which are sung in these tree planting ceremonies, you know, in the villages. You know? <coughs> so that way, Tagore has really done his lot. Number one. Number two, as a national figure, in fact, if you want to find out two two persons in India who are national figure in all parts of India, right from Kashmir to the southernmost part of Kanyakumarika or the western part of Mumbai to the eastern part of Gauhati, you will find in each big city or town, there is a Tagore Hall. You know, in each, just close your eyes and go to any town you will find a Tagore Hall, uh, the, one of the most important thoroughfares, the roads made after him, you know, Tagore Road. Um, so he is, in fact, the real Indian leader, you know, all India leader. So that I can assure uh, uh, Sergio that Tagore was that way. You know, not all, there are many good leaders who are regional leaders. Or maybe you know, uh, in their own localities, good leaders, of course, did many good things. But Tagore was absolutely uh, an, an Indian leader, and he is also very much appreciated all over India because of his you know literary, environmental, you know, uh, pedagogic activities. And people from all over India come to Shantiniketan. You know, to his university, to his school, to study, to research. I won't take more time. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. I, I, there is a question from that that uh, maybe we could we bring out together, but but especially to today's speakers. Uh, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm in the chat, Tomasios, uh, uh, you, you are you are voicing the, that we should bring in our fields. Uh, the, the, the liberating and radical dimensions of lifelong learning and social justice as active citizenship. Could you could you could you tell us something about what you think are how would this become practical or how 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 does because I, I'm I'm with you. There's many words, but but I think we need action too. Uh, of course, it is uh, a suggestion and maybe a. It's very in common, uh, but uh, or maybe a wish. Uh, but I just put it just for a reminder. And of course, we are all uh, practitioners and uh, researchers, esteemed researchers. But uh, of course, on the, on the daily practice, uh, I, I'm a practitioner uh, working with vulnerable groups. So it's uh, so I see that many people. Still, in our time, in 2022, with so means, so so great means, various means of uh, of uh, new technologies, uh, are are still are still in this position of uh, magic consciousness, and uh, I feel obligated. I, I feel that uh, our man mandate is uh, is to is to bring people uh, nearer to the to the to the critical consciousness. And to 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 enrich their rights as citizens, as human beings, 
uh, because our times are, are in great upheaval. So uh, I, I'm not a, I, I'm not the, a wise man that I can bring, uh, bring examples of uh, these uh, daily practices, huh? but uh, I just uh, I, I just make this uh, make, let's say provocative uh, statement that it's always a, a bless, a, a wish, a, a reminder, and also to uh, to sympathize and to to make. Uh, uh, empathy for uh, all, all our colleagues, uh, regardless of the, even they are even they are working in higher education or in uh, with vulnerable groups or uh, or as trainers. But uh, we have to, I think that we have to keep in mind that in these upheaval times, that we have to uh, make a statement that uh, we we have the knowledge that people with far difficult uh, situation. As well. So I can also remind, remember uh, Horton of Highlander, uh, the Antigonist movement, uh, Aris Mantiarenda in, in Spain, where well, uh, charismatic personalities that encourage people to, uh, with, with the use of adult education, uh, Basil Yaxley in the UK, uh, so that they encourage people, vulnerable people. I think that's absolutely common, a combination that is possible. Uh, we, we, I think we should give a, the possibility of a last comment to, to, to Ashok and Sergio. Could you, Ashok, could you, could you give us some thoughts about the dialogue today and the connection to what you started up with? Yeah, actually, <coughs> I have uh, told quite a lot <laughs> in these sessions, so I do not want to take more time. But the thing is that when I have studied these three thinkers, I have found that although they are in, in different times of history, almost hundred years, you know, between uh, between them, yet you know because of the conditions of their own country, they had thought in the same way. Grunvig, his democracy was just coming; his people had to be enlightened. And he went for all these things, through high school and all that. Then uh, Freire, and his uh, democracy was, you know, was really being tested. You know, the illiterate people could not vote. So he had to come out with his, you know, new methods of literacy and, you know, whatever he has come out with. And then uh, Tagore from a colonial standpoint. He wanted to enlighten his people, you know. The, the British colonialists did not want to enlighten Indian people, particularly the broad masses. They wanted a few people, you know, just the upper class, you know, to be educated. But he did not like that. So that is why he gave that alternative pedagogy, Indian pedagogy, which is meant for the whole people of India. So I think these three thinkers have in the in their point of time thought of the liberation of their own people and came out with their pedagogy and there is very much relationship in these three pedagogies which i have discovered in my reading of their works you know mm -hmm. and their deeds thank you Um, thank you, and and then and, and I think we'll give uh, the uh, Sergio. Could you also have? Do you have a, a concluding word from your point of view, where we connect these three and and today's the situation today? You are just out of a pretty heavy political situation yourself, where you have been very engaged in the election of a new president. How how can how we can that's that's practical action, and this is pedagogical theory. How how do they connect? Well, one of the issues that we discussed in our group was how much people from the outside, from previous centuries, from other countries can influence the works that are carried out 
in each one of the countries, in each one of these countries. How much uh, people from the north or people that are that have been for many years uh, or produced many years ago can actually influence the works uh, such as where they can influence in Brazil or India or an African country and so forth. What we discussed is that in actual fact, it's not just like Freire always said that he hoped that it's not uh, applied in various realities, in the, the way in which he produced his knowledge, but rather a reinvention at each point in time from his ideas and other ideas. I think that that's more or less what these three authors can help us with uh, to reflect on our reality. These are their features, but the most important, I think, is that in actual fact, it's the option that they had of working with popular uh, sectors of society, sections of society that will determine, in a way, the ways of resistance, the means of resistance on one side and on the other the means to build a new world, a new way to relate to one another. I think that within each one of the countries and in the international framework as well, we saw this in Seattle, we saw that it's in Spain, in the social forums internationally, these are practices that these thinkers brought us in relation to horizontality, respect for each other's uh, words, uh, lovingness in relation to nature and to human beings. These are the values. And uh, not a pedagogy in and of itself that is a finished product to be applied to one place or the other. So I think this discussion helps us to reflect uh, on these issues. Thank you very much for the opportunity.